15, 15, 20 years now, they've been engaged in a program of research conducting very effective public health communication campaigns, helping adolescents live healthier lives. And Seth has been a part of that project over there for the past decade, having graduated from the University of Rhode Island in social psychology. And he now is PI on a number of projects and has now moved into the digital age as well. So today he's going to be talking with us about interactive communication and the promise of using online technology for HIV prevention and other kinds of preventive behaviors among mostly adolescents, right? Uh, and other yeah, populations. Yeah. Great. Absolutely. And the other thing I want to thank Seth for is that he's also been involved in creating the Health Communication Conference at the University of Kentucky. It's a wonderful biennial conference, small, so you really get to know each other, that attracts most of the health comms people in the, the region, at least. And we tried to get him on the dance floor last year. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Well, maybe I should get going here. I think we're I think we're up and running, and there might still be clicking sound. I have a few video clips later in the presentation to show you, but I think we can get going. We're gonna run out of time here. I want that to happen. Uh, so again, I want to thank uh, Jane and the uh, JOMC for having me, and uh, Shelly and the Cancer Center for having me in. So it's just a great opportunity to meet with people and talk about some of the stuff I'm working on and hear about all the amazing things going on here. So my talk today is going to focus, as you can see, on interactive health communication. And so I want to first acknowledge uh, lots and lots of collaborators. Uh, I know folks here will appreciate the fact that uh, best research comes out of collaboration, uh, working with lots of folks. Uh, across different disciplines, different perspectives, different ideas. Um, we have lots of research teams, graduate students, with faculty across departments, and uh, I want to acknowledge lots of collaborators, particularly on these three projects, which I'm going to talk about today. And we, of course, want to acknowledge some of the funding uh, institutes that have funded some of this work, uh, NIMH and CDC in particular. So before I get to the, what I'm going to focus on today, um, I just want to give you a quick, uh, quick glimpse of three areas that really sort of uh, focused on my research. The first is sort of health behavior and communication theory. So 
<coughs> I believe that if we want to, for example, develop interventions, develop campaigns uh, to change behavior, we first have to have a theoretical understanding of how people change their behavior in the first place, how uh, you know, the most effective messages can be creative, uh, can be created. Uh, otherwise, we're just kind of guessing and don't have a, a way to accumulate that knowledge. So I'm very interested in uh, testing, thinking about it, applying different kinds of theories, understanding their potential as well as their limitations. Um, that's one. The second one, as Jane mentions, I've been involved in a lot of campaigns work. When I came to uh, University of Kentucky in 2001, I joined a, a newly funded project uh, uh, examining mass media campaign to change health behavior, um, in particular trying to use more rigorous evaluation designs, which has certainly been the norm, uh, certainly been the exception rather than the norm. A lot of campaigns have not been uh, evaluated that strongly. So we have been doing a lot of work in that area, uh, and I'm interested in the development aspect as well as how can we evaluate these kinds of efforts uh, in a stronger way than has been the norm. And the last area, the area I've been moving toward in uh, recent, uh, recent work, is interactive health communication, which is what I'm going to focus on today. So, uh, like a good public speaking person, I'm going to give you uh, an overview here. I'm going to uh, introduce interactive health communication that, in terms of the, the big picture. Uh, I'm going to briefly discuss uh, three studies to give you three examples of some of the ways we're trying to use this work um, for health behavior change, and then with uh, some ideas and thoughts, uh, particularly focusing on the, in the cancer prevention area. <clears throat> okay, well there's a few areas here where I will probably skip things or go a little bit quickly so we have some time for, for interaction at the end. Um, and so I'm not just talking the whole time here, but folks in this room will be uh, very acquainted, I think, with the problem of uh, lots of uh, poor health behaviors. Uh, both in the United States and globally. Um, you know, there are papers uh, like the Mock Dad paper talking about half of all deaths in the U.S. Uh, each year are preventable, and that the, the three big behaviors, of course, that contribute to those are smoking, uh, poor diet, and physical inactivity. Um, and so clearly, there are big behavioral health challenges that we have. Not only that, but I've done a lot of work in the HIV area, uh, an area in which there's there's no clear you know medical uh, solution that's going to stop the epidemic, at least not right now. And even biomedical kinds of uh, uh, technologies, innovations that are coming out are going to require a lot of behavioral research, um, uh, which also ties into vaccines. Like for example, the HPV vaccination I'm going to talk a little bit about today. Uh, it's the same thing. We we. We sort of feel like if we develop these great vaccines, people are going to go out there and, and get them, but it turns out, no, it takes enormous effort in terms of behavioral research and marketing and other kinds of things to get people to use these innovations and ultimately uh, promote health uh, and prevent uh, disease. So, um, looks like some of my types are a little too small here, but uh, that's okay. Um, what, since I'm going to be focusing on technology and interactive health today, just wanted to put up a few stats just to make the point that, uh, and you may know this, but it's incredible to see the technological changes that are happening in our society. Um, <clears throat> early on, uh, internet use was just coming online and uh, no one really knew what the potential was going to be. Now we just see uh, just broad access to the internet. Uh, the Pew Internet and American Life Project keeps doing all these really interesting surveys and finding, you know, growing access to the internet uh, on desktop, on mobile, uh, finding the digital by closing, um, finding, for example, on mobile phones, interestingly, that actually African Americans and uh, Latinos actually are more likely to have cell phones than whites and are actually heavy, heavier users. Um, and, but across all populations, very high proportion of folks have uh, cell phones. So you can see just in terms of these technologies, you can probably see most of these numbers are in the 60, 70, 80 percent. And so it provides, uh, provides a real opportunity. Of course, in communication, one of the first things we look at is what channels can we use to reach people? And clearly, these kinds of technological channels, uh, channels are increasingly uh, looking like good, uh, good ones to consider. So interactivity uh, is something we'll focus on today a little bit. Uh, interactivity is a hotly debated uh, area in terms of what it even is, how it's defined. Um, 
Little did I know uh, how much debate there would be. So one definition here, uh, which is tries to be comprehensive, focuses on uh, communicate te communication technology, creating a mediated environment in which participants can communicate one-to-one, -one, one to many, many to many, um, and sort of refers to the ability to perceive the experience as a simulation of interpersonal communication. And that's one of the really exciting things about uh, interactive interactivity and interactive health communication. You know, communication, there's sort of been this mantra that mass communication is, you know, capable of the broadest reach, but interpersonal communication is capable of, uh, in term, has the best persuasive capabilities. And so a lot of folks have been talking about interactive health communication, particularly on the internet, the potential for it to be a hybrid where we can reach large numbers of people, but also have more uh, really persuasive elements. Uh, and there's really a lot of excitement around. So I focused on sort of interactive health communication using that term. There was a science panel uh, in the late 90s coming together where, where a bunch of big names came together and defined what is interactive health communication. And it's, it's essentially applying this interact, interactive technology to health. And they defined it, and so interactive health communication I see is kind of a conceptual background uh, and interactive health communication applications are sort of the software. Uh, the actual applications that people use to put this stuff out there. And so that's kind of a distinction there. And so to make it more complicated, before I go on, so there's other terms that are similar. So people, e-health is becoming, uh, in many ways, a new term in this area, although it's not clear uh, which terms will have staying power and which terms will not. Interactive health communication has kind of a long track record, so I'm uh, fairly certain that one's not going to go away. But you see other terms used in the literature, e-health, e-health tools, e-health communication, you know, new media tools for health, uh, consumer health informatics. These, these, are, these things are not, not all exactly the same, but they refer to largely overlapping uh, areas. And in some cases, are exactly the same, the way that people are defining them. In fact, even e-health, there was a paper recently on you know, 87 different definitions in the literature for e-health, and what does it mean? Um, but, to make this more concrete for you, here are some examples of the kinds of things that I'm talking about. So what am I talking about? What's this IAC stuff? Internet-based health interventions, uh, mobile device interventions, text messaging interventions, uh, tailored interventions. Uh, there's these interactive video interventions where you're not just watching media content, but you're actually, it, it stops at points and lets you make a decision about how the story goes. Um, virtual environment, I just read a chapter on uh, these avatar type interventions, uh, which create an avatar of yourself, um, and some interesting studies now showing some health effects of those kinds of interventions. Video games, there's lots of stuff on health video games. Uh, and there's still things like interactive voice recognition technology, which may not be sort of as uh, sexy in a way as uh, some of these other technologies, but there's some good literature on, on some of those things being being effective, being efficacious. Uh, and of course, got to mention social media. I've told a few people, I was just at the CDC Health Marketing Conference, and uh, which is largely a practitioner kind of conference, uh, some academics, but literally like half the sessions were on social media. So clearly, uh, social media is just appearing everywhere, uh, but also in health, they're just out there already doing stuff. And in many ways, researchers, we've got to play catch up in terms of trying to understand how to use this tool. So, we, uh, Jen mentioned our health communication conference. Uh, I kind of pushed to have this be the topic for our pre-conference this past conference, and we, we ended up doing that. And in recent history, we've been doing kind of a special issue or something to come out of that. Well, in this area, I kind of had the observation that there's really no book that pulls together all these different technologies. And so, uh, my colleague Nancy Harrington and I are editing a book now, which will have chapters on all these areas. So, I have to really start pulling together this, this large area. Okay, so a little more time on some of this intro stuff, and I want to get into showing you some of the work we've been doing in this area. Um, lots and lots of advantages of the IHC. I mentioned one of the advantages uh, in terms of the, the reach and potential efficacy, and there's lots of other uh, advantages in a lot of these technologies. We can be networked together. We can have multimedia capabilities. Uh, there's convenience. There's support on demand. You, if you wake up in the middle of the night and and uh, you want to get on one of these things on the internet, that's no problem. You can try to call your doctor in the middle of the night, you probably won't be able to reach him or her. Um, and, you know, one of the most critical here um, is the cost issue. 
So, uh, I had some conversations with uh, colleagues here earlier that we've developed so many interventions that we can't disseminate, either because the, the format in which we, they, we've developed them, the structure, uh, is not going to work in the real world. And sometimes uh, issues as simple as cost uh, get in the way of us actually disseminating things. And so this combination of internet as delivery system, um, being able to ta individually tailor or use the interactivity and other things to kind of personalize content, as well as the potential low cost to deliver these things once we've developed them, is a potentially potent combination. So there's growing evidence for the efficacy of interactive health communication interventions. More and more reviews and meta-analyses coming out showing, uh, yeah, this stuff can work. Uh, uh, it's part of health behavior change. Um, I and my colleagues have focused a lot on tailoring. Uh, we published a, a meta-analysis. This was on print tailoring, so individually tailored interventions uh, that are sort of computer-generated print materials. We found that these were efficacious and uh, particularly for smoking and diet, the big three up here, like smoking, diet, physical activity, particularly for smoking and diet, uh, seem to work relatively well, not as well for physical activity. I wanted to share with you a, uh, a newer meta-analysis we just uh, have just finished up uh, on web-based tailoring. So now we're talking about more interactive web-based uh, uh, interventions that, that do tailoring. And it's striking to me how similar the findings are. We found a very similar overall effect size, although I should mention it's highly heterogeneous. And in fact, these interventions themselves are highly heterogeneous, uh, meaning that we, we really have effects all over the map, and the, and the interventions themselves are all doing very different things. So we really need to learn more about you know, the, the, the active ingredients of these things. But same thing here. Pretty well for smoke, pretty well for diet, not so well for physical activity. So we definitely need to do some thinking about that in terms of uh, using these tools for physical activity. Um, I also wanted to mention, um, we did a comparison, I think we need a lot more work in this area, but I wanted to mention this. So the, the, the area of multiple behavior change is, uh, is really picking up, and it's an area I'm interested in uh, as well. So in other words, a lot of the health conditions and diseases, uh, of course, including cancer prevention being a big one, involves multiple behaviors, not just a single behavior. And while we've had some kind of, uh, we've had fruitful approaches using this single behavior approach, our theories are focused on single behaviors, I think we need more work looking at uh, and developing programs that address multiple behaviors. I want to mention here, we did a comparison in this web-based meta-analysis of tailoring of programs that focus on a single behavior compared to, a mul to multiple behaviors, and we found uh, no significant difference in the effect sizes, uh, which really suggests that uh, some of these programs that focus on uh, multiple behavior are being successful and not, in many cases, undermining themselves by trying to do too much. Um, I just saw uh, Paul Krebs and colleagues have a new meta-analysis out on Taylor, and he actually found the same thing, totally independent of ours. So that's kind of promising, but I should mention we definitely need more work in this area, including a meta-analysis just focusing on, on multiple behavior change, because it's, it's complicated. But I think that's a, pr a promising direction. Okay, so what I want to focus on is uh, what I've had some conversations uh, with uh, people this morning in terms of, um, I think we've learned some hard lessons in the health behavior change area. In particular, we can develop interventions that work, that are efficacious, but if we really want to have an impact, we have to get these things out there. And so, you know, I would say, uh, on the one hand, we've done a great job in many ways developing efficacious interventions. I think we've done a pretty lousy job developing effective interventions. That is interventions that we can put out there in the real world. Uh, and so it's one thing for someone to work in the lab or work in a trial. It's another thing to get it out there and have people using it and have it have real impact. And so to do this, I think we really need to identify opportunities of how can we develop things that we can integrate uh, into practice rather than just developing things for the sake of developing them. Uh, and so, in fact, I mentioned to someone, the uh, one of the reviewers of our book proposal said, why are you studying all this stuff? It's all about social media nowadays. All this, this should, book should be all on social media. <laughs> you know, we can't just hop on the bandwagon of the hottest thing. We really have to think hard about what uh, what technologies are going to be most fruitful in what uh, instances, and how can we develop things that actually can be put out there and used and have an impact, and not just, ooh, let's see if we can develop this to develop. Okay, 
So travel back in time with me for a minute, hop in the DeLorean, let's go back in time um, to uh, a world where, uh, before my time, uh, you, well, this picture, but we used to go into banks, we used to talk to human beings, and that was, there were was some neat things about that, uh, it's nice to have interpersonal contact, but it wasn't very efficient, particularly when computers came out, and so, you know, industry uh, are very efficient and cost effective, and so now we don't really do this anymore, right? We bank on our computers, we bank uh, online, we bank on our mobile device, and so the same thing has happened uh, uh, when you go to the grocery store, right? You used to uh, interact with a human being, and sometimes you still do, but uh, with technology, they realize, wow, instead of, instead of having six checkouts, six people, you can just have one, and you can have six self-service checkouts, um, and it can be much more efficient and cost-effective. And so we should learn a lesson from this um, in, term, in health promotion. So if you look, for example, then while we're in HIV, you look at sort of risk reduction counseling and social cognitive kinds of interventions, these human deliberate interventions. Um, yeah, there's lots of studies showing that, that they work. But in terms of efficiency, in terms of scale, in terms of cost, they're very difficult to disseminate. And if you move into 2010, one thing that really struck me was it's still the same stuff. We're not really using, why are we not using technology for things that we can be using technology for? Um, and so if you look, for example, in the HIV area, you'll find that the interventions that uh, CDC recommends as gold standard, the Debbie project that has tried to disseminate interventions into practice is entirely human delivered intervention. There's not a single intervention. Any, in any of those that, use, uh, that are, are interactive or that use computers, which really struck me. Um, and so I really thought this was an area with a lot of promise. And I know Jane agrees with me because one of her studies is in this meta-analysis that we did. So we did a meta-analysis um, looking at this because there were some people in HIV that were kind of skeptical that a computer could do the kind of health behavior change that humans have done in all of these studies. So, lo and behold, we did a meta-analysis and we found overall a significant, a nice effect. Uh, we also found some uh, evidence that individually tailored interventions may be some that have uh, some of the most promise. There were not a lot, this is a meta-analysis of 12 studies, that's, that's all there were. This is condom use, so this is uh, change in the health behavior. Um, and so, we thought that was pretty promising. And not only that, but the effect size compared quite favorably to effect sizes from meta-analyses of the human-delivered interventions. Um, and we were really struck, wow, these things really have a lot of potential. Uh, and in terms of the ability to bring these things to scale, there's really much more potential than uh, the kind of human-delivered interventions that, like I say, work, but oftentimes we've had a terrible time disseminating them out there. So the one on top there is, is the... So this is the one on top of D.26 was the effect size we found for computers to deliver interventions wow, in HIV. So that's higher than the and it was actually higher than, um, than you know, many, many other meta-analyses in human delivered interventions. Uh, of course, the qualification is that, uh, for example, of our in 2005, there's like, I don't know, 100 studies in that. There's 12 studies in ours. So their effect size is perhaps more reliable, uh, but uh, very promising in terms of um, and at the very least, uh, suggest more that we need more investment in those kinds of interventions. So I'm going to tell you about the first project here, uh, one <coughs> where we said, well, it looks like in HIV these tailored inter these computer tailored interventions have a lot of promise, and we're working at an STD clinic, a publicly funded STD clinic in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, I don't know if folks know STD clinics are sort of, in some ways, infamous for really not doing much prevention or not doing any prevention at all. Again, the gold standard for the CDC is Project Respect, which is a one-to-one -one counseling intervention. But if you look at the volume of people that come through these clinics, they have to have a cadre of counselors, and most of the clinics that I'm aware of just don't have that. If, if they're lucky to have one or two, most people are cycling through the clinic, they're getting treated, they can sound their way, high recidivism, and it's just such a missed opportunity, especially when you consider that these clinics have lots of wait times, uh, you can't make an appointment typically, so people are spinning and waiting and waiting, and, and, and it's such a missed opportunity to do some health education. So we developed a program we call TIPS, the Tailored Information Program for Safer Sex. 
It's focused on African Americans given the disproportionate impact uh, on HIV uh, among African Americans. We did this systematic process, got this three year grant to develop the program to test it. And so I mentioned the context, the population, heterosexual African Americans, 18 to 29. Uh, these are low income folks living in an urban area at uh, this publicly funded clinic, and we're trying to promote not only consistent condom use, but correct condom use. And so this is a tailored intervention. It, has, it features individually tailored feedback, as well as uh, skills training around condom negotiation and correct condom use. And so we used uh, this ASC uh, theoretical model, um, and the program branches in HIV. Partner type is very important. So. Uh, folks have very different perceptions around condom use if they have a main partner versus casual partners. And so the program branches, uh, I can't read this back there, but it branches in terms of the different kinds of partners and people get different modules based on sort of the partner profile that they have. And so, as I mentioned about the skills training, I want to show you just some screenshots of one. So we have this activity in the intervention around correct condom use. That's interactive where we, where we show, you know, we go through the steps of correct condom use and say, what, what's the correct way to do this? And so if they answer the correct way, they get, you know, that's right, good job, and we show the, the correct model again. If it's incorrect, we say, no, that's incorrect, we tell them why, and we show them, uh, no, this is really how you should do it uh, in order to do it uh, properly and not have problems. Here's another one, we're putting a condom on, you should, you know, squeeze the tip, one hand, versus just unroll, and again, if they, if they choose the right one, uh, they get reinforced, show the model again, correct one that goes the other way. Is, is there anything moving in these, or is that just, these are the skills and that's what These are doing? skills, um, but I have something moving for you coming, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have something moving. So uh, they go through the activity, and then when the whole thing's over, we, we put the whole thing together with some animation. Oh, no. So there's our animation there. Just from a health communication perspective, just worlds above. You should see where we ordered all these condoms as part of this project, and they come with these little tiny things with like three size font that go through all the steps of condom use. And that it's like you're kidding, me, right? <laughs> just get one of these out of each condom. It's like you gotta be kidding me. Um, we also give people uh, targeted materials so they're able to take something with them when they finish uh, the session uh, with the computer. And so we're testing this program in a randomized trial. Uh, again, I'm just giving a flavor for each of these things because I wanted to cover a few studies. Um, and so we're randomizing people to get the TIPS program and uh, as well as the targeted materials versus a computer assessment plus some information-only materials. All participants receive condoms. And it's a small trial, so they interact just once with the computer and they come back in three months for follow-up. Uh, and we're hoping we can generate some efficacy data and then uh, move forward to a larger uh, kind of study. Um, but the, the um, okay, so data so far, uh, I didn't mention earlier, I have some data to show you, uh, not as much uh, as I would like. Uh, if I did this talk, talk a few months from now, I would have more. Uh, but I've got some data in, in these areas. We will have efficacy data uh, before too long here, but we've enrolled a reasonable number of folks now, and we're, we're recruiting every day. And our retention has been excellent, so I've been very happy about that. It's a difficult population in some ways to, to stay with. Um, this, these are questions they answer at the end of the program on that first session. So did you like it? Did it keep your attention? Uh, all these kinds of things. These are on, on five-point scales. Very promising here when you come back for another session. 4.5 out of 5 would you recommend us for a friend? 4.52 out of 5. So some indications that you know we're, we're, we have some acceptability here. 
Uh, and we did focus groups with a lot of formative research and really got a very positive response to this kind of program. Um, and so again, this, this is the kind of case. So, so this is the kind of case, this is one model here, this first model here. We're taking a human-delivered intervention, which, uh, which is difficult to bring to scale, which many contexts cannot use because of cost, and we're replacing with the technology intervention. But I want to talk about another approach, which is enhanced usual care with technology. So we can use interactive health computer communication or just simple technological interventions to enhance usual care. And again, achieve more efficiency, effectiveness, bring things to scale where we might not be able to do it otherwise. So here I want to talk about this HPV project that we're doing. We're working in Eastern Kentucky, uh, which has very high rates of cervical cancer. Um, pap testing rates are low, and when young women go to actually decide to go to get uh, the HPV vaccination, they actually they often don't come back for the second or third shot. My colleagues did a study offering free, uh, some people I know, just the cost of the shot sometimes is a barrier of the vaccination. My colleagues did a study where they offered it for free and got many women enrolled and they get the first shot and uh, it was like 10% came back for the second shot and 3% for the third shot or something like that. Um, and so really, physical rates of, and it's a, unfortunately it's a three shot series uh, currently. Uh, and so to get the full protection, you need to come in for the three shots. So we have this Rural Cancer Prevention Center, which is funded by CDC, um, to, uh, to use community-based participatory research um, to increase PAP testing in Eastern Kentucky, uh, as well as to increase HPV vaccination. Rick Crosby is the PI on this. Uh, he's in public health at UK. Uh, so it's essentially a large social marketing effort where we use media, media messages, um, and hog roast, so we have a hog roast that we have in Eastern <laughs> Kentucky, and say, come on down, come on down to our hog roast, we'll have a good time, and while you're here, we'll give you your first HPV vaccination shot, and we'll get you set up for your second shot, and um, you know, it's, it's gotta, go, gotta go where the people are, right? So we teamed up with Walmart and other places where, where people go in, where these kinds of things can be, can be brought out in the community, rather than always saying, you gotta come to, to us at the clinic. Um, and we had this non-equivalent control group design where we essentially have a six-year project to try to promote these behaviors and try to move the needle on some of these uh, behaviors. So I wanted to talk a little bit about within this large social marketing effort, uh, we are doing an RCT because again, getting people to get the first shot, getting these young women to get the first shot is the first step, but the follow-up piece is a critical second step. Um, so. In this case, we're actually not technically using interactive health communication. Uh, folks wanted to do something that was going to be easy to scale up, that was going to be a simple technological kind of thing. And so what we are doing here is we're running this randomized trial, we're using the social marketing to get women to get the first shot, and then we're offering folks the opportunity to enroll in this RCT, where they get usual care, which consists of things like information about the vaccine, uh, scheduling their follow-up, or they're getting those things, but they're exposed to this 13 minute or so uh, motivational DVD that we've created. And so I want to talk about a little bit, a little bit about this video intervention. And so what we're trying to do is to, to really build motivation, excuse me, to get women to return for the second and third shot. Uh, so we did a lot of formative research trying to understand barriers to getting the shot, to coming back, um, and a lot of, you know, it turned out women had a lot of concerns about HPV vaccination, about the shot, about what parents and friends would think of them getting it, uh, in terms of some of the stigma, about sexual behavior, and things like that. Um, the fact that, you know, these young women, 18 to 26, aren't sitting around worrying about cervical cancer, uh, but, they, but they were concerned about reproductive health, so when they hear that HPV could potentially uh, cause problems in terms of reproductive health, that was, that was more at the forefront. Um, and so this describes sort of some of the ways that we took what they told us and developed this into, um, into these DVD video messages. Um, there were also things like, uh, you know, fear of the PAP test procedure, what, you know, a lot of these women had never been before, and so what's the doctor going to do? And, um, and so in this video, we actually have a, a nurse practitioner who takes each of the tools out and shows them 
what they are and how they work and what happens at any appointment. Um, and we did s several things here to try to, um, for example, we recruited a local, uh, uh, very popular news anchor who was also uh, affiliated with uh, some of the cancer efforts in Eastern Kentucky, and she was kind of one of our featured people in the video um, to talk about uh, pap test and vaccine and talk about you know, really protecting their reproductive health. Um, we had the local nurse talking about things in terms of showing them, demystifying the whole annual exam and pap testing. Um, we talk about, you know, okay, so people maybe uh, have different views about you getting this, but this is your body, you want to protect your, yourself, and you know, your, your friends and family members should want what's best for you. Um, and so this was an interesting one too, this last one here. So there, we actually found some concern about this vaccine, because it's this new thing. Well, is it, is it safe? You know, do I have to worry about, you know, this thing, what's this going to do to my body and things like that? But at the same time, there was some kind of intrigue about this new opportunity. And so uh, we tried to emphasize the safety and effectiveness of it, but also uh, find a novel way to, to talk about it. this really is an exciting opportunity that uh, previous generations didn't have. Uh, so let me show you a couple short clips. This is our logo here, one, two, three, pat. So first shot, second shot, third shot, pat, in terms of uh, the sequence that we're trying to promote. Tools to do it so effectively. So, can we develop tools to help them 
do their job better. So instead of developing something for sort of the end user, the consumer, the participant, we can develop tools for practitioners who are out there uh, doing, doing important work and may not always have um, the tools. So let's note the rent and uh, give them some new tools here. <laughs> so we have this project affiliated with a rural HIV STD uh, prevention uh, center at IU. And um, this project, we, we did some uh, work with local health departments uh, across the nation. So that RCAP uh, is national and has a whole network of, of, across the nation in terms of folks that do rural HIV STD prevention. And we got funded this project and talked to folks at these rural health departments and found out that when they're out there doing uh, health promotion stuff, and here we're simply folks at HIV, but just really across the board, uh, where are they getting their health promotion materials? <laughs> surprise, surprise, ETR. They get the old ETR at the catalog, which I get in my mailbox once in a while, which with all due respect to ETR, it's really generic stuff. Uh, and a lot of these kinds of pamphlets and things, I think most of us who, who know about health behavior change, research theory, uh, suspect don't have much uh, at, at impact, if any at all. And so we felt like if, if folks at these health departments really uh, had more capacity to develop, for example, more targeted, locally relevant materials, they could do their jobs a lot more effectively than using these really generic materials. So thus, uh, Project Create was born. Uh, we actually first kind of put together a manual that we, uh, that we came up with in terms of guidance on creating your own materials, but we thought we have to give these folks a tool. We can't just say, here's something to read, this is how you do it. We need to give them a tool to really um, build their self-efficacy and give them an actual tool they can use. So, and the neat thing here is the World Center for AIDS STD Prevention has this whole network already. They have a website, they have a, an email list. Uh, we did this report on HIV STD in rural America, We've gotten all kinds of requests for it. There's artists, they do a conference every two years. So in terms of the delivery system and dissemination, it's kind of built in because we already have this whole network of folks um, in this particular area. And so the idea of this site is Folks can get on, they can develop these customized materials, they can order them, and then the way it would ultimately work is RCAP would receive the order, they would have the materials printed, and they would send them to the folks uh, at the local health department. Uh, perhaps the folks could you know, print the stuff off themselves, and we're going to try to set it up so we can really uh, have the ability to do high quality stuff. So the way this works is on the site, people pick if they're focusing on STD or HIV. They say they choose the group they're working with, men who have sex with men, heterosexuals, induction drug users. They choose the race uh, of, the, of the target population that they're focused on. Um, every time they get down one of these paths, uh, it's getting more specific. So now someone's clicking here, clicking here. Now they're, all these statistics are brought up that are specific to the population they're working with, as well as taglines uh, that may fit their population. And so it's kind of true like this. So this is uh, this is the site. Folks log in. Right now, the, for for the first generation 1.0 here, we're focusing. We focused on creating posters, uh, really locally relevant, targeted posters that folks can use in their efforts. And so here's the screen. Once they are going to make a poster, it says, you know, who you want to develop them for. Click on your population, um, which uh, racial group, things like that. And so you can see here it says, you have chosen where I clicked on HIV youth and African American. So uh, that's the population I'm working with uh, as an example. So they click next and what do they get? They get all of these images that they can select from that are of young African Americans. They get statistics that are specific to African Americans and HIV and they get taglines that also uh, are specific as well. So then, so this one I chose, uh, my, the statistic I liked here for this one, in rural America, African American men and women account for 50% of the AIDS cases, and I click "Be a Force for Change" for the for the tagline. And so there's my nice customized poster um, that I can use. And so I click continue. I click order, and we, we get it set up, and we send uh, send these things to folks that ordered them. And so here are a bunch of examples of different evidence, like the this one right here. The, the colors are not good, but examples of different kinds of posters that we. Uh, can create. We, uh, RA and I went through and created a number of these um, using this tool. And so now folks can instantly, with this tool, develop these kinds of materials that are likely to be much more relevant uh, to who they're working with than the really more generic kinds of materials. And we took, we created all, we did all these photos ourselves, by the way. We put together 
photo shoots, it was a whole long process where we learned that we can't just drag uh, images from Google Images or anywhere else. There's all kinds of legal issues that we had to get into. Ultimately, the conclusion was we're going to do, take our own photos. We have to form. People have to sign the sign off and let it use the photos, and we're, and we're off and running with it. Uh, and so here are some different. Uh, some people are making the heart. Says, Absence makes the heart grow fonder. Uh, so there's all kinds of customized posters. Both make and we're giving them the power to do it uh, rather than having to choose from a catalog of three active stuff. We are literally next week launching an evaluation of this site. So I have no data on this one currently, but we are just about to launch an evaluation. We have presented pieces of this, ideas of it, at uh, previous conferences and gotten a lot of really uh, positive feedback. And we basically said, we're developing this for you. Tell us what you like, what you don't like, what would be useful, what wouldn't be useful. So, move toward wrapping up here so we can have a little time for questions or comments or things. So, our focus today is, is uh, uh, more on cancer prevention, the cancer folks uh, come to host me here. So, I wanted to conclude with some thoughts and implications for cancer prevention. Uh, and so, we can think about these areas, we can think about, you know, in cancer, um, there are likely to be contexts where we're doing human delivery interventions where we can develop interactive health communication tools uh, that are going to be more efficient, more effective, more scalable than the human delivery interventions. There are also likely going to be opportunities to enhance usual care, as well as context where we can develop tools for practitioners, uh, as a few examples. So, for example, in areas such as uh, the big three, quitting smoking, physical activity, diet, we, we've developed a lot of efficacious programs, for example, in tailoring, but we've done a terrible job of get, getting out there. In fact, I was uh, invited to a conference a few, uh, uh, meeting a few years ago put together by NCI uh, to try to understand how can we disseminate tailored interventions, computer tailored interventions. Some practitioners out there have heard about this stuff, right? It's this hot stuff in the literature. Oh, we do all this tailoring. And virtually none of it's been disseminated. Uh, and so we need to figure that out. We need to figure out, and that really uh, is on us to say, so we got this stuff, it's efficacious, but we have to find a way to get it out there. It's not doing any good sitting on a shelf. Um, it's not actually serving uh, the public who we're, who we're trying to serve with this stuff. So one idea here in terms of human delivery interventions, we need to think about developing stuff, not only that works, moving beyond an efficacy question, but that things that can be effective. We need to think about delivery systems. Um, like I said, RCAP has this built-in network. Um, what about something like the Cancer Information Service that uh, could be a delivery system? We need to think about what are some of these delivery systems that we can use. So when we develop tools, and we have that great RCT, we get that great publication, look, this works great, we can then move it beyond that step uh, and get it out there where it's being used and, and having an impact. Uh, rather than saying, oh, okay, now what? <laughs> where does this thing go? What do we do with this? Uh, it works, but who's going who's gonna to use it? Um, clearly, with the growth of smartphones, uh, thinking about mobile health, people are talking about M health will be a very compelling option. We've been just blown away in Eastern Kentucky. So many folks have iPhones. And we're talking about lots of rural poverty, and they seem to all have iPhones. They're blown away by this. Okay. Didn't, we didn't expect that. Uh, but it's, so clearly, mobile health kinds of applications are going to be compelling um, and an option we need to think about. We also need to try to get a sense of how do, how do people access such programs. So just for fun. Uh, before I came um, uh, here yesterday, I got into Google and I said, all right, I want to quit smoking. So I typed in quit smoking. <laughs> i got to say, I was very unimpressed with the top ten sites that came up on Google. In fact, the first site that comes up is smokefree.gov, which is probably one of the better sites, but it was just all static text. And in fact, the top ten sites, I could not find any interactive tool that was mildly interesting. It was all, it was a lot of marketing junk. Um, and like I said, the legitimate ones like smokefree.gov, there, there were no interactive tools or anything that uh, uh, were, were there. And that really surprised me. So even uh, forget reaching out and being proactive with population-based stuff, even if we're looking for stuff, uh, it, it's not there yet. Uh, Lorian Abrams, who's at George Washington University, has just had a nice content analysis of iPhone apps for smoking cessation. And so she just presented this at the CDC conference I went to. And 
Um, shocker, uh, she found that you know most of these apps are, are likely just being put out there to, to try to make some money. It turns out you can sell an app for 99 cents, doesn't seem like much, but if you sell it to half a million people, you know, then you're making some money. Um, but she evaluated these apps just on um, uh, essentially the five A's. So are these evidence-based just from what we know about the five A's and, and those kinds of uh, theories? Uh, and the, five the five A's are like as, it's assist, arrange follow-up. So these basic things that you should do um, uh, if a smoker, for example, about asking their status about quitting and, and moving along this path. Uh, similar in some ways to kind of the stages of change idea. And so uh, uh, she found very few of them had any kind of evidence base. Very simple kinds of things like calculators to calculate if you quit smoking, how much money you would save, and things like that. And so, uh, yeah, again, out there in that, that's a, a apps are going to be a wonderful delivery system, I think, for health behavior change programs. And currently, we, we're not there yet. We don't have them yet. Um, and we need to be moving into that space and developing these kinds of things. So when people want to use these tools, they're there. And then, of course, once they're there, we can more heavily promote them and get people linked up with these kinds of uh, programs. And so, let's say I don't want to spend too much more time here, but um, we know that you know, in primary care, physicians have very little time for prevention. Uh, we don't do a good job of prevention in this country, of course, and even if it's primary care physicians and others want to do it, they don't have time. So can we have can we have them prescribing some of these kinds of programs in addition to prescribing pills, which they're so used to doing? Um, and so, you know, how about, a, how about a video game around childhood obesity? So in addition to the doctor talking to the parent about what their child should be doing, you know, does your child play video games? Okay, well, I'm going to prescribe this video game. I want your child to spend, you know, if they're spending 30 minutes a day on playing video games anyway, play this video game. There's a really neat work in health video games showing uh, effects on diabetes management and other kinds of areas uh, among children and other groups. So it could be a really compelling area. Again, we got to go, we got to use the channels and go where the people are um, if we want to, to have an effect. Um, oh, I want to mention, I mentioned someone earlier about uh, something I learned about this conference I just went to is this Text for Baby program. Uh, I don't know if people have heard about this. So Text for Baby is, the, is essentially, best I can tell, the first um, mobile health program in the U.S. that has been fully brought to scale. So imagine developing an intervention, right? <coughs> uh, a text-based intervention having 70,000 women sign up for it. So they've got over 70,000 women who have signed up for this program. And essentially, they're focusing on maternal and child health, and apparently the numbers in that area have been uh, going in the wrong direction, particularly among low-income women. So uh, there's this huge coalition of organizations that got together develop this uh, text-based program. We find, uh, we found in our work and others are finding that, uh, you know, cell phones heavily used by lots of audiences, including minority groups, low-income folks, and text messaging is a great way uh, to reach them. So they developed this program. And so imagine, uh, think about this as an idea for HPV vaccination. So you go in and get the first shot, and you're, and you're giving the shot, Sarah, before you go, text join to this number. And then over the subsequent weeks, you get some motivational messages as well as reminders about coming in for that, those next two uh, shots. And so this could be a model that could be scalable um, and something that could, you know, that could potentially work. The text for baby, apparently they have some evaluations underway. Uh, we don't have all the data in yet, but it's clearly a compelling option based on the channel as well as based on the potential uh, ability to, to scale things up. Uh, Use. And what they've done, I think that's been very smart, is they've developed this program, they have this whole thing going, but it's not a top-down in terms of uh, they have all these local organizations involved, so it's your doctor telling you, oh, this program, sign up for this program, it's great. It's not some email coming from some organization you've never heard of. They've built this whole coalition of organizations that uh, are sending the message to their, their uh, patients and clients, people who they trust. And so it's really an interesting model for, for possible and last but not least, this, this idea of uh, developing tools for practitioners. So who's out there uh, doing cancer prevention? Who's out there promoting uh, health behaviors, local health departments, state health departments? How can we help them do their job better rather than only developing interventions ourselves and trying to put them out there? How can we develop interactive and technological tools that allow them to, uh, I mean, a lot of folks
folks in those contexts that are overworked, underpaid, and um, trying to uh, tackle all kinds of different health problems. If we give them tools to help them do their job better, we will be doing uh, everyone a favor. As I mentioned earlier, they want more tools. They want tailored communications, for example. Uh, they've been asking NCI, uh, their dissemination branch, you know, we keep hearing about this tailored stuff, where is it? Um, and to my knowledge, they, they still haven't found a, a way to disseminate it. Um, and so we, we're learning some lessons about, about how to do that. Um, and so I think I will wrap up there so we have a little bit of time for questions. But uh, thanks very much. studies that have actually looked at comparing, sort of controlling for the same content, but just comparing interactive interventions versus static presentations of the exact same content, and, and, and looking at the relative effectiveness of one intervention versus the other? Yes, very good, very good question. Uh, it's funny, I was thinking about that the last few days, uh, because obviously, <clears throat> one of the things I'm making the case for here is interactivity is good, interactivity can help us. Um, some folks argue that interactivity is you know, necessary health behavior change. Um, and so, yeah, actually, particularly in the tailoring literature, um, for example, web-based programs, a number of studies have compared static websites to more interactive websites. Um, I don't know that all of them have tried to make all the elements identical in every other way. Um, and in fact, in our, in our web-based meta-analysis, I'm trying to think, a number of studies did, did do that. And from what I recall, now, we are finding um, greater effects among these more souped up websites that have more interactivity in them. Um, it's not to say that interactivity is a magic tool for any, you know, not by a long shot, and that maybe it's not always better, uh, but I think generally speaking, interactivity is going to uh, engage people more um, and which ultimately they may be uh, successful. So my, my uh, impression of the literature is that, uh, that we do have evidence that <clears throat> interactive uh, sites, for example, uh, more efficacious than, than more static sites. Yes? Actually, just sort of following up on that question, when we're talking about interactivity, are we also talking about the difference between sort of an animated approach or something that provides feedback based on some input from the user? Uh -huh. Um, is there research differentiating between that, or can you discuss yeah. that? It's a good question. Um, there seems to be, um, there of course is a whole literature on interactivity itself, and what is it, and how do we define it, and there's stuff on perceived interactivity, and it, you know, and sort of more objective interactivity. Um, I think the way, I think the definitions typically, um, come into a case where the person does need to be inputting something and getting something back. And so, for example, I have cheated a little bit here because the DVD intervention I wouldn't describe as an interactive intervention. It's a more of a one-way model. Um, so, so I, I think of it, and I tend to drift more toward the definitions that focus on that sort of give and take kind of thing. And that's, you know, uh, theorized by some to, uh, to perhaps be, you know, necessary to help behavior. In fact, even in you know health campaigns, there's lots of theory and not much data, but there's beginning to be more data appearing, uh, trying to get at this fact that you know campaigns <coughs> probably don't work in that hypodermic needle kind of model, right? They, they probably don't work. We see the the campaign, we see the messages, and we just change. But there's likely to be a much more complex process where we see it, we think about it, we talk to someone about it, and perhaps. Uh, change comes through that process where there is sort of interpersonal kind of things happening. Um, and so, um, but I don't know that in the health area, folks have done as good a job delineating between those different things with health programs. Yeah. Just a broader um, health prevention question. In terms of 
vaccines, either anecdotally or empirically for data, um, why don't we get vaccinations when they're clearly the best way to cover large populations and stop it? We did get some press, uh, there's pneumonia, there's hepatitis B, there's a number of things that people can get that are really serious diseases. Yeah. Why, why aren't we getting those? Why aren't we getting those? I mean, why we why, why the population? In the 1940s and 50s, uh, the uptake on, say, small town vaccines mm -hmm. was nearly 100%. Yeah. On um, most of these others, it's, it's relatively low in the system. Uh -huh. Well, I'm not an expert in the vaccine area. Um, I know that, of course, that crazy guy in the UK, <laughs> I think his name was Wakefield, right? Who uh, now the British government has finally, like, uh, come down and out and say he's a really bad person and right that I mean I, I know as a as a parent with young kids uh, you still have parents worrying about do our vaccines tied to autism and that whole that whole debacle. And so I know there are, you know, and then of course there are some legitimate concerns. I mean some really small proportion of people get vaccination has negative effects. But clearly for you know for public health and population day, I mean I completely agree with you that vaccines are are an incredible biomedical tool, and uh, I mean, many think that HIV won't be solved until we ultimately have some kind of vaccine. Um, but you know, that's the scientific argument. But you know, we're going to get to real people, and um, you know, and, and things like that, and with rumors and things like that. So, but again, I'm not an expert in that area, so I can't give you. Yes. Yeah. Seth, I have some limited experience in interactive, very oh, you know, tailored health. Communication. Uh -huh. One of the things that I, I have observed in various schools of public health, for example, is that people who come to studies, whatever, you know, the PI or whoever, even people who help often don't have the technical skill to do the stuff. So you, you go out and you hire somebody who does flash or you hire somebody who does these things. That person may not be a public health. In all likelihood, it is right. a public health person. So, it seems to me that we're going to things a not backwards, but there's a whole other side we need to be working on. And that is we need to be developing public health technologists. And I don't see that happening. And I, and I think that, I think that if, if people who have, uh, sort of who have the, the spotlight, like you do, as you do, uh, could be doing more to, to get the people who, who, are, who can write good code, who can write job, job script, Fletch, HTML5, all of these things. Yeah. To start turning apps, okay? To yeah. start turning their attention towards these things. Yeah. I think we would go a whole lot farther because otherwise it's, we're always going to be playing catch up with the technology. Right. Well, what's wrong with a model where I've got the expertise more on the, on the health side, the theory side, and I work with 